Okay. Experience. Ready? Yeah. Yeah. Loosen up, loosen up, loosen up, wiggle it out. Okay. This is Burn This Book, a banned books book club, where we, Nicole and Eden, read a banned or challenged book twice a month and discuss its meaning, impact, and censorship to make it more accessible for all readers. This week's book is And Tango Makes Three by Peter Parnell and Justin Richardson, which was published in 2005. Joining us today is Candace Flannery from Springville. Candace is a full-time lecturer slash professor at University Valley Utah, Utah. <laughs> Utah Valley University, UVU, and um, she teaches intro to bio, and she teaches many of those classes. I don't know how many. She can go into more details about that, um, but yeah, so Candice, will you tell us about yourself and your connection to the book? Yeah, so I have been teaching college biology for seven or eight years now, um, mostly teaching to non-biology majors and with the goal of helping them see how biology can tie in with their day-to-day life. And I absolutely love it. Um, And I am also the mother of young children, so I have a love for children's books. Um, But as I heard that Eden and Nicole were reviewing this book, I immediately thought of examples of, you could say, in the view of a human, non-quote-unquote traditional relationships in mating structures in nature. Um, And so that's kind of what brought my special attention to this (laughs) piece of literature. Yes. (laughs) Thank you. Thank you. So good. So good. Um, Yeah, so for for a quick summary of this picture book, um, it is about two penguins. So it's based on a true story of two penguins in a zoo that are both male and are hanging out a lot with each other. And they're uh, mimicking the other couples in the uh, herd. Flock. (laughs) Flock. Thank you. (laughs) In the, that's why they pay her the big bucks to be a biology professor. In the murder. I don't even know if that's right. <laughs> I'll look it up. I'll find out. Keep going. Um, uh, yeah. So all the other couples in the flock are um, hatching or like sitting on eggs and hatching eggs and like all of that. Um, and so this couple also tries to mimic that, um, but it isn't until the zookeeper saw that their love for each other that they found a baby penguin that needed some parents and um they named it tang named her tango um because it takes two to tango they said (laughs) (laughs) um and yeah it's a cute little story about a little penguin family yeah um i'll just give you my first reaction yeah i thought i was cute (laughs) <laughs> I didn't really have any other thoughts about it. I don't know. I'm no, I don't have children. So I don't I don't I don't even know how to put myself in the mindset of like, should my kids be learning this right now? But I did find um but a lot of people are really upset about it because they feel like it is um trying to teach kids that they should be gay or trying to say that like gay families are the only way and it's it's a, it's more on the right side of politics who are really fighting against this book. Um I did find this is going to be my only contribution because I don't like have anything else to say other than like it was really cool and it's a true story. So what are you going to do about that? Um but there is this <laughs> PBS published this cute little interview with this um second grade teacher in Slate Hill Elementary in Worthington, Ohio. And um They asked him why he teaches this book to his second graders. And he explained, one of our main standards in second grade is creating a community. When these students go out in the world, especially in Columbus, which is a big city, they are going to be surrounded with all different types of people. And yes, they may not agree with someone's life choices, but they still need to be able to accept people for who they are. If someone were to challenge my teaching of this book, that's how what I would explain to them. And the interviewer asked him, they were like, so how do you know that your kids are mature enough to understand this book? And he was like, well, it really depends on the students. It depends on if he feels like they under, they can even under, like handle the concept of community and if they can be open with each other about the, each of their families. 
Um, but it's really all about him being able to find if his students are ready to have that conversation. So it's not like he just throws this at kids who don't even know what it means to be part of a social group. Um, and so it's a very intentional decision and it's very timed out by this teacher. And I'm sure that speaks to most teachers. (laughs) They're not just going to give something to students who aren't ready for it. Mm -hmm. The purpose is to just help them understand there's different lifestyles. Yeah. Which I think is really important. This is my mom brain on, not my yeah. biologist brain. But so I have a four year old and she is in preschool. And actually, just last week, she came home and said that one of her friends told her that girls can't kiss girls. And she said back to her friend, Well, I like to kiss my mom. And so then she told me about that. Yeah. And I was like, You know what? You're four. Like, you don't need to make, like, these romantic decisions right now. And I didn't say all of this <laughs> right. to her, but as I was processing what to say. Yeah. And I was like, let's actually turn this into a conversation about consent instead. Yes. And, like, <laughs> safety. Mm-hmm. And so that's what I did. And I didn't even touch on, like, yeah. can girls kiss girls? I just totally was like, you get to say if someone gets to kiss you and you only kiss people that are okay with you kissing them. Yeah. And that's all we did. And But just overall thinking about it, obviously this changes by age, but at certain ages, I don't necessarily think that it's important for kids to decide like who they're romantically interested in. They're just learning how to be kids and yeah. part of a community and how to use a fork. Like, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's mostly, like, observational skills at this point. So, like, um, anytime Mabel walks by a really tall white man, she'll be like, Dada. (laughs) (laughs) It's like, yeah, he is tall like Dad. (laughs) And, like, that's how I, like, help her process, like, that observation. um, Because she doesn't have the words for it. Yeah. Yeah. And even at her daycare, so her daycare goes from 18 months up to second grade. So it goes into school, but at her daycare, there are several gay couples who drop mm-hmm. off their kids. And so like, eventually Mabel will start noticing that and be like, oh, like, John's, well, I don't know the kid's name, John's <laughs> dad and John's dad, you know, yeah. and like that opens up a conversation. It's like, yeah, like there are some people who have two dads and they love each other very much, much like how me and your dad love each other very yeah. much and they love their kids very much. You know, it's just like just a sh- uh, modeling different types of families for yeah. yeah yeah which I think is honestly the whole purpose of this book. I think so too. Yeah, is just yeah as you both said, just modeling different types of families. And the the authors are partners. Yeah, and so they they wrote this together. Just tender. That it is, is really tender. tender. It's a really cute, intentional way of practicing activism in a yeah. kind way. Yeah, in yeah. creating space. Yeah. Yeah. Not that activism is sometimes unkind, but you know, this is a very gentle form mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. of activism that's still making very a lot of people very mad. Yeah. <laughs> like the outcome is still making people just as mad as if they yes. did this in another way. <laughs> I think yeah, one of the to segue into like the, some of the more some of the topics Candace probably knows more about, I like a lot of the reason why people are upset is because they're upset about the homose- like portraying homosexuality in animals, specifically. Mm. I'm just like, oh, like, no. <laughs> are they questioning it and being like, no, these penguins are a perversion of natural penguin life? Like, are they just being like, no, this is a freak example? Is that what they're kind of saying? Well, and I, I wonder if some people don't realize that it's based off of real penguins. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, quite frankly, I didn't realize that at first either. Um, but I wonder if that's part of it. Like, why are you making gay penguins? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. But the reality of it is if the general population understood all of the different things that happen in various mating systems... Male and female, not straightforward. Males meeting with females, not straightforward. Even, so, historically, it's been like, oh, these birds, they do their dance, and then they mate for life. David Attenborough (laughs) narration. Not true. Yeah. (laughs) Not true. There are extra pair copulations happening all over the place. 
Whoa. So they'll have like their life partner and then the male will like go out and meet with other females all the time. Oh, that justifies so much garbage. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but right. yeah. <laughs> um, and like there's so albatross, um, they're a type of bird, they're known they can glide for extremely long distances, just yeah. float through the skies. And they um migrate really, really long distances. Anyways, um, they've also had really long studies done on them where there will be female pairs that raise offspring together. And they'll, in some cases, consist- consistently stick with the same females. Um, so that's one example. Um, this is so interesting. And they'll literally, mm-hmm. like, they'll have the same behaviors as a male-female coupling, where they'll um, each take about three weeks turns of mm-hmm. incubating the egg. Um, and they'll just alternate whose turn it is, um, depending on the year, mm-hmm. um, for who lays the egg um and that's just what they do and so fascinating yeah and then we want to get in more examples yes (laughs) i'm loving this (laughs) um so another example in some species they can perform what's called parthenogenesis so parthenogenesis is basically asexual reproduction and when asexual reproduction occurs just kind of all around, it's typically a female that can do it. So we see this in several different types of species. One group of species that this is really well studied um, is in whiptail lizards found in like New Mexico, Northern Mexico. Um, and many of their populations have no males, but the population persists because they basically clone themselves and to kickstart that process the females will lay on top of each other like they are Mm -hmm. going to mate and and that's driven hormonally and it helps to kickstart that process so then one female will then lay an egg that's a clone of herself and wow yeah that is incredible yeah that is so crazy and it's like I don't know, I just am, I'm thinking about, and I don't know if this was news, but I just found out, like, within the last couple years, that we can see our sexuality, our sexual orientation in our DNA. Is that true? Did I make that up? There, uh, that's not the whole story. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Misinformation from Tell- Nicole. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. I don't know, but I heard that and I was like, that sounds cool. <laughs> so, there can be genetic yeah. links. There cannot... Yeah, okay. Genetics is... It's honestly a mess. Oh, uh, Gattaca. Right. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, even in your high school biology classes where they had you do Punnett squares and they're like, can you roll your tongue? Do you have dimples? Yeah. Many of those traits, it's actually multiple genes that contribute to those traits. Yeah. And the same thing goes with sexuality. And then there's, you know, some parts of sexuality that don't even show up in genes. Like, that's not... Fascinating. The whole so I I have a question. I'm just gonna ask you questions. Now. Go for this it. This is like very <laughs> much my tangent. dream experience. <laughs> so with um so when you're talking about these lizards, these mm-hmm. whiptail lizards, mm-hmm. um is it like the entire population practices um like procreation this way, reproduction this way? I don't know what words we use in biology. Thank you. Um or is it like just a few? And you never, like, kind of like these penguins, where it was like, yeah. not the whole group so, is doing this, it's just these the two. In the case of the lizards, yeah. there are some populations that there are no males, and so that's, that's okay. the only way to have their population persist. Gotcha. Hmm. Yeah. Wow. But then in other examples, yeah, like with the albatross, mm-hmm. that, I just reread the article in preparation for this, um, it was a population that was on the island of Oahu, and I think it was about 30% of females would be in female-female pairs. Wow. I think. We can go back and double So back, it's but. not it's not a crazy idea to think that, like, that within the human oh, no. group, that we're going to have a percentage yeah. that is different, that practices sex differently yeah, than, I mean, than another percentage. You can look through the entire animal kingdom and see examples of same-sex relationships on various forms, whether it's raising young, whether it's touching, yeah, 
and whatnot. Um, Mm -hmm. You see that all throughout the animal kingdom. That is so... Why did we never learn any of this? (laughs) That's a good question. Because uh, these authors didn't write... (laughs) They've only wrote one book about this. So, so, so here's another, another one. It's like uh, something about Albert and the albatrosses or something like that. Yeah. <laughs> oh, no, it'd have to be. Or no, Alberta. Alberta and the albatrosses. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so here's another weird one yeah. um, that has a lot to do with the research that I did in graduate school. So I did research on seeing if there was sexual mimicry occurring in fish. And the fish that I was studying. Um, Real quick, what, what does sexual mean? mimicry yeah. mean? Yeah. So one sex mimics visually the other for various reasons. Mm. Um, the hypothesis for my sex, spe- or my sex, my fish specifically, was um, the males would try to force copulations with the females. And so the original hypothesis was, well, if the female evolves to look more like a male, it won't be so aggressively mm. attacked to be mated with. Whoa. Yeah. I didn't find anything that suggested that. In fact, I didn't really find anything at all. So it's just <laughs> likely that the females looked like the males just because they're genetically similar. Um, but I had to try to find other examples of sexual mimicry in nature. And one really well, not really well-known, but decently (laughs) well-known example, is the spotted hyena. So in spotted hyenas, um, females are actually more dominant in their social structures. Along with that, they have a pseudo-penis that looks like a A non-pseudo-penis, and they in fact even have testicular-looking structures, and it can go erect and everything, and they also give birth through it, which <gasps> oh. kills a large percentage of them. Oh my goodness. Because <laughs> they like, it's... suffocate in like a tube kind of thing? Well, it oh, kills no, 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 a lot the, of the females. The females. Yes. <coughs> because yeah. it's a very small opening. Oh my yeah. gosh. Mm-hmm. Fascinating. Yeah. So do we know why they have a pseudo penis? Um, it has a lot to do with their hormonal levels and ways that they show dominance and behaviors. Um, is it like an evolutionary mm-hmm. thing? Like, yeah, to, pro- they, to protect themselves? Yeah, they've evolved that. to have this pseudo penis to help with their dominance and just their social structures. Wow. Mm-hmm. And it, and it's not like a conscious thing. No, it's not like they woke up and were like, "I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm have gonna this. grow right. this right now. Right. I'm gonna grow this." Yeah, <laughs> right. Yeah, it's you know over wow many 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 years that trait has just been successful. And yeah. So that's what's passed on from generation to generation. That is so fascinating. And you know, so we've talked about lizards. We've talked about birds. Hyenas are obviously mammals. We we see this in primates though. And in bonobos, we're really closely related to bonobos, yeah. and bonobos are like, they shouldn't be in zoos. Let's just say that. <laughs> they are very, very sexually promiscuous. Many are bisexual um, and will perform sexual acts with either either sex. Fascinating. That's fascinating. That is really interesting because I remember uh, my only contribution to this conversation <laughs> Is that I was at the zoo once with my yeah. daughter, and um, we were looking at bears. And the there was a um, middle-aged couple next to me. They were kind of muttering to themselves, like, see, look at that. Like, that's natural. Like, the men are just... <laughs> the males are just uh, uh, reproducing with the females. And, like, there's no uh, none of this, like, switching and, like, moving around and whatever. And I was, like, super close to be like, you know, like... <laughs> Uh, uh, the way the way I said it to Greg was really crass, so I had to figure out a way. That was like... <laughs> but um, maybe I'll say it. <laughs> you can figure Go. it out. Okay, yeah. it's like Thanks. you know that monkeys just jerk each other off, right? <laughs> just, yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Anyway, so moral of the story: we see it across the animal kingdom. We see. In other, we see in species of birds, both male male pairings. Mm-hmm. We've seen it 
you know, amongst penguins and black swans. We see female-female pairings, like I mentioned with the albatross. We see it in reptiles. We see it in amphibians. We see it in fish. We see it in dolphins. We see it in hyenas. We see it in primates. We see it in apes, you know? And if you say, oh, what's natural? What's natural is it's all over the place. Mm -hmm. And that's just because of how nature is and Mm -hmm. how it works and just how species have evolved Mm -hmm. and how these um, mating structures and social structures have evolved. And that's just how it is. So no, it's not far-fetched at all to say, well, with humans, with Homo sapiens, there can be a wide variety of traits and behaviors. Yeah. Yeah. It's really interesting because you can tell that the best argument against this is, well, science is wrong. And then pit science against religion because, you know, because then the other justification is like, well, the Adam and Eve is the only justification I feel like people have in religion. And the best way to say like, because to me, all of this is like, yeah, obviously. (laughs) But if I want to shut it down, I just say, well, all of science is wrong and evil. I think probably another argument, though, is people view humans as not so animalistic, like we're something totally Mm. separate. And so if you say, well, humans aren't truly animals, Mm -hmm. then you can't have these animalistic behaviors, right? And so what's natural for human, humans must look a little different. Um, But again, if you agree with science, you see genetically we have similarities with all other species and high percentage of similarities with some species. Yeah. You know? mm-hmm. And suggesting that we're of the same root. Yeah. Actually, going back in time far enough. Anyway, and so I think a lot of it, thinking about science as a whole, um, a lot of it falls under not fully understanding what the nature of science is, what the purpose of science is. And what type of information science can actually tell us? Yeah, I was about to bring that up. Just like there seems to be maybe lack of understanding of what science is. Mm -hmm. Like the way you presented your your thesis was my hypothesis was. And then you said, I didn't find anything that confirmed or denied that. (laughs) Yeah. Um, And and that's what science is. It's just a, a series of many millions and billions and trillions of experiments that Mm -hmm. one person just thinks I wonder Mm -hmm. yeah and I think and I was proven wrong or I was proven right and then like someone else can pick that or if you're getting really nitpicky oh yeah yeah. use the word prove you say there's not evidence to support this or there is evidence to support this yeah because with science we always acknowledge that there might be something we don't know yeah 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 I understand I love that. It's so humble. Mm -hmm. And something that I was thinking about when you guys were talking to to bring us back to the start of the conversation. (laughs) Sorry, I should have talked about this earlier, but it's okay. Everyone's fine. Um, Is when you're talking about that, like the observation piece that your kids are right now at those like observation stages where they're just acknowledging what's around them. And I'm, I, it got me really thinking about one of my best friends, he's gay. And he told me that he knew he was gay when he was five years old. And I started, like, thinking about my experience knowing I was straight. And I I knew I was straight very young, but it didn't mean there was a sexual nature to it. Yeah. I just meant that, like, when I saw a boy that was kind of cute, I acknowledged, like, oh, he's kind of cute. And it was different than when I saw someone else who was kind of cute. But, like, and I think when we talk about people, because I think that was more observational than it was sexual yeah. or mm-hmm. hormonal and I when I think about a lot of my friends in the LGBTQ community who tell me that they knew that they were in that community early early on I feel like a lot of people really panic because it goes straight to a sexual space for them mm-hmm. in their minds mm-hmm. when it has nothing to do with that I think it's just completely observational mm-hmm. um and I, I I love how you guys explained like this the whole point of all of this is like just to just to introduce <laughs> Yeah. yeah. These different, just to make sense of these observations yeah. that your kids are having. And if this book was allotted, allotted, given to my friend when he had made that realization about himself, and if it was a safe space for him to have shared that, 
They could have easily shown this book and been like, yeah, there's other people like you. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. There's penguins like you. Or even, <laughs> you know, which is a cute way to go about it for a little five If he yeah. hadn't shared it and yeah. he saw that book, yeah. he could say, oh, there are other people like me. Yeah. I'm not so alone yeah. Yeah. in these things that I'm observing. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's really important for kids. Mm-hmm. Having identity validated yeah. at such a young age is so critical. And we see yeah. that all the time. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yep. Um, yeah. Okay, what other cool animals? Oh, jeez. <laughs> I just love this <laughs> so much. Now I'm obsessed Notes. with those. Le- leopards. <laughs> lizards. Liz- and the lizards. Well, the leopards. The leopards? They have the pseudopenis. No, hyenas. The hyenas. Spotted hyenas. Dang it. Hyenas. Hmm. That creates a little twist for me on Lion King. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the whole group. Oh, here you go. Lion King, just to add some more <laughs> twist to the Lion King. Uh-huh. Um, lions, we have actually seen infanticide in lions. So, when, so there will be a male over the pride, so a male who will, one male yeah. will fate with, mate with several females. Yeah. But, if another male comes in and fights that male, wins, then he takes over the pride of all the females. And kills all the offspring from the oh, previous male. Oh my goodness. And females will go into heat. And if females are currently impregnated from the previous male, they will go often into spontaneous abortion. Whoa. Whoa. Like their body is just... Expelled. Mm -hmm. That is so crazy. So then here's the question. Because I feel like critics could be like, well, then that's justifying a polygamous relationship. Or a cult, you know, that kind of relationship. So what would you, how would you be able to justify the argument that if we see this in nature, it's natural. And um, with people who are like, well, the R. Kelly thing is normal. Like him sleeping with all these young women and being in charge of them to the point where their bodies are expelling (laughs) other babies, you know, like how, how would you be able to critique or respond to that. Yeah, so, I mean, first of all, nature is amoral. It's without morals, Mm -hmm. right? And as humans, though we are a part of nature, the way that we've developed, we do have morals, right? And so it does come down to what do we agree on as society of what are appropriate morals to have. Yeah. And so... I think that's a bigger conversation. (laughs) Yeah. I think so, too. Because you could also argue, like, well, they're also killing everybody out there. Like, it's very much eating, you know, like, you just have to kill your neighbor to eat them. Right. Yeah, so I think that is a true thing. But I've always wondered, like, because, yeah, because people will pull back kind of thing. And um, because, yeah, the bottom line is, are people safe? Are we trying to create a community? Yeah. Which is not necessarily what everyone everyone I don't know how to hot talk about things like this that's not necessarily what all these different species are doing is trying to create a community that's governed by the same ethos and respect to land property and freedoms and things like that like Mm -hmm. there's a lot of different things happening and also like emotional capacity yeah Yeah. empathy yeah we have that and I mean like if we look at evolution there is evolution of social behaviors and Mm -hmm. social structure there's evolution of personality things like that and so it just so happens that the way that we evolved led us to evolve to these social structures right such a good response and so it's then (laughs) up to us with these emotions that we have with the ways that we can think Mm -hmm. to use our brains to make decisions about you know how are we going to take these social structures and help them be beneficial for us as a species. Mm-hmm. Gosh, I want you to talk to everyone <laughs> in the whole world. <laughs> Can we just do like a circuit, a touring circuit where uh-huh. you just explain this and you're just like... I'm probably not the best at explaining it, but... I thought you, you did. Really well. You did yeah, great. You I was like, I don't even know anyone. <laughs> oh, the people, animals, what are they called? <laughs> <laughs> Those little creatures. <laughs> Earth- Earth- earthlings. Yeah, the earthlings. <laughs> the sky people. As they say in Avatar. <laughs> oh, my God. That. It's long. It's tough. <laughs> For me. A lot of people really loved it. And I can I can say good for them. 
I haven't seen it. <laughs> it's just long. The dialogue is tough, but I think all James Cameron stuff has tough dialogue for me. <laughs> it's fine. Moving forward. Back to what we're really talking about. I don't have any other I comments. Don't have any, uh, yeah. Did you have anything else you wanted to add? No. Can we tell, can you tell us where, okay, let's do our guesses of where and how it was banned, why it was banned. Yeah. Because I think we already guessed. My guess is because it's talking about gay people. Yeah. Gay penguins. Gay penguins. S- specifically gay penguins. But, yeah, that it's modeling yeah. that gay relationships are, oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. That they can have a child that's happy. Yeah. 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 <laughs> and learn how to swim. Yep. Yes. Mm-hmm. Tango learns how to swim at the end of the book. We never said that. It was really cute. Tango's pretty cute. <laughs> yeah. Um, that's my guess, too. Let's look it up. <laughs> it's really, like, about animal rights and, like, zoos. <laughs> They're like, we don't support zoo books. <laughs> oh, boy. Okay. <clears throat> Let's look this up. I like that your typing's gonna be on the mic now, which is kind of cute. Yeah. To have. T- 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 okay. Makes it authentic. It does. And Tango makes three. Okay. People objected to Antango makes three because it is. The purpose of the book is indoctrination and it exposes students to alternative sexy. sexual. sexual. <laughs> sexual ideologies and contains sexual innuendo. Where was the sexual innuendo? Takes two know. to tango? Is that the, the innuendo? I feel like that would have to be it. I was, um... It takes two to tango. I actually was reading this book called Why Gender Matters by... Let me look this up, too. Oh, I... Oh, maybe I just saw that you posted about it. <laughs> <laughs> by Leonard Sachs. Um, and he, he talks about how people's, like, society's approach to gay culture is that it seems to be a very sexual culture. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, but that is not the case. Uh, the reason why that is that seems to be the case is because men are more sexual beings. Mm. Well, they seek more sexual gratification, whereas women seek more of the emotional connection. Fascinating. So, yeah. So And, and so that's why I think this person is saying sexual innuendo, because, like, Oh, this is a gay penguin couple. Mm. Maybe they're very of the stereotype. The stereotype and the the stereotype. Yeah, interesting. That's so interesting. Which is so interesting too, because the book is like, yeah, they like to hang out together. Essentially, yeah, yeah like they're sudden, nothing. Yeah, they hang out. The most sexual quotes, quotes, quotes it got was when it was like. They would go to sleep together, and then they'd wake up next to each other. Yeah. That was it. And yeah. it was, oh, yeah, that I was all it that. said, and it wasn't like, there was nothing explicit. There was nothing no. about... There was, it was just so peaceful and sweet. It was really peaceful. And it's a little bit silly. And the indoctrination piece is really fascinating. And the exposure piece, that's the one that really is crazy, is like, where... And I think I get to this with every book. It's like, where do you want your kid to be exposed to these different ideas? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you want it to be in your home where you're bad at talking about it and you're Mm -hmm. weird? Or do you want it to be in these spaces? That's why they have sex ed. Mm -hmm. Because parents are so awkward about it. And going back to exposure and society, we have this society and our society has progressed and there are now families that look different yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. and so why not help children as they observe as we've yeah. been talking about help them to observe and yeah. so it's something that they're familiar with yeah. and just like accepting like oh this is a thing yeah yeah period yeah. and it's yeah. not saying it's a good thing it's a bad yeah. thing it's not saying anything it's just saying it's a thing yeah and the book highlighted that there were other heterosexual penguin couples yeah. that mm-hmm. were doing the exact same things that yeah. were sleeping next yeah. to each other and hanging out with each other. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. Also, I think that also speaks to the point that none of us actually have to decide if something's good or bad. Yeah. And yeah. I think we're in this weird place. I don't know if it's because of social media or because we just have the internet. So we have so much information where we are always placing, uh, like, yeah, a morality attached to everything. We have to have an opinion, like, is that relationship good or bad? Is that thing good or bad? But yeah. I think that's a great tie back to Candace's consent mm-hmm. conversation with your daughter. Yes. It was just like, it's bad if there was no consent. Yeah. 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 And uh, it's good if there was. And then yeah. we can just move on. 
you know. Gosh, can you imagine a world where people understood consent that early? Ugh. And, like, that was, like, what was moved forward. And, like, there was that healthy understanding of, like, you need to trust your feelings and you can make choices based off of how you feel. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That would be... That'd be amazing. Oh, this is what I was going to also say about what Candace was saying. Like, our society's progressed. Also, even before, like, before colonialism, families looked really different in yeah. a lot of communities, especially yeah. indigenous communities yeah. and African communities and throughout Asia. Like, families looked really different until white supremacy and Christianity um, from a white supremacy focus and, and framework came in and started dictating what was good and bad. And so we're just now starting to return as people are finding their roots and finding those traditions that have survived through genocide. We're starting to return back to those spaces where you do have a two-spirit member of your community or you do have families that are matriarchal. Um, And so it's interesting, like, it's both a progression and also a return, which Mm -hmm. is very fascinating to me. But, Mm -hmm. like... In order to have a healthy community, you have to be able to name what's happening in there. Yeah. And if your kids can't name it, they're going to fear it. And mm-hmm. that's where a lot of, like, anger and hatred comes in. Yeah, totally. Totally. Especially those white kids. They got to they gotta not be afraid of stuff. <laughs> they have been in, leader, in power oh, too long as a white... <laughs> As a fellow white. No, seriously, <laughs> being able to name stuff has been like, oh, okay. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I don't okay, need to be stressed. This is mega tangent, but even going through therapy and, like, thinking about myself, yeah. like, when I can say, oh, I can name this as anxiety. Mm-hmm. Yes. It helps me work through it so much better. And yes. I feel like that's applicable, yes. like, looking outwards as well. Like, I can name what this is. And it doesn't have, as we've said, doesn't have to mean good or bad or yeah. anything. It's just like, I can name this, so now I can approach it. Yes. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Especially families who, they don't, especially like parents, if they already are on that mindset, and if their kid does come out to them, they've already yeah. named the situation, and it's not, it's amoral. And yeah. so this is just my child. Mm-hmm. This is my child, and yeah. I love, love them. them. Yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> well, I love this person. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, but it doesn't have to be about throwing like I just think we do that so often with identities is we throw a good mm-hmm. or bad on someone's mm-hmm. identity and that is mm-hmm. so weird I do that with myself and that's where a lot of my anxiety comes from mm-hmm. Same. <laughs> Same. therapy is helpful therapy is yeah. wonderful I think also like, yeah just that labeling of good and bad can be applied to any like everything mm-hmm. so there's that one book called intuitive eating mm-hmm. oh yes yes, yes. Like, trying to unwrap like uh untangle naming things Certain foods good and certain foods yes. bad. And yeah. Just, like a lot of shame that goes around. Yes. Eating quote unquote bad food. Yes. But yeah. And there is a place to name good and bad, and yeah. that's in behaviors. Like, well, and that's that sounds bad. But you know, like stealing. Uh huh. <laughs> stealing, harming people, making it so that other people are not safe, or you know, openly cutting people off from resources just because of the way you feel about them. Like, that's bad. Mm-hmm. Those behaviors that that lower um, equity and all that kind of stuff. Lower? Decrease? I think, yeah, like... Yeah, so we, there is we a place for earlier. that that labeling, but I don't... I think we have misplaced it as a society because out of, like, a need to control. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah. I think... Um, I guess in terms of, like, label, uh, labeling... Like, helpful yeah. labels of good and bad. Like, are you building community versus not building community. Yes. Because, like, yes. if you are stealing, you're breaking down community yeah. because of that love trust. That. Yeah. And I love that. If you're discriminating against a gay couple, you're, you're not breaking... building community. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 I love that. I think if we were a community-oriented society, things would be... Different. Totally different. Yeah. Because you're also not afraid of your own community. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Total tangent, but that has an impact on, like infrastructure and Mm -hmm. yes yeah the the literal infrastructure of the community looks different if you trust the people in your community Mm -hmm. yeah that whole not in my backyard Mm -hmm. and all of that yeah that's Mm -hmm. breaking community yeah 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 oh it's so interesting and it's it's fascinating also because all of these could be used as arguments against because they're like well what is my community and what's not my community yeah so there's always that thing and so it's like a never-ending conversation 
Um, which is infuriating. But I guess that's why we do this. It's because yeah, it's also important to it have those important. conversations. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't have anything else to say. Oh, what year was this banned? 2005? 2005. Uh, it was banned consecutively. <laughs> Like, it was the most challenged book of 2006, 2007, 2008. So it's banned over, and it, like, banned well into the 2010s as well. Well, and currently... And currently, yeah. Oh, wait, I didn't count that in my thing, because I forgot we're in the 2020s. Oh, my. (laughs) How did I forget that? Gosh. I need to change some, uh... Well, that's an error on our Instagram. It's banned over three decades now, probably. That's so crazy. It's currently... Not in a school district in Florida. Mm-hmm. Well, for sure. Um, That's actually where I first heard about this. Yeah. Because of the... Yeah, because this totally piggybacks on the Don't Say Gay bill. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And also, which is a bill also that's trying to be copy and pasted here in Utah. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. FYI. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Where there's <sighs> a massive LGBTQ population. Mm-hmm. And the highest numbers of suicide and mm-hmm. of youths. Mm-hmm. So maybe something to think about. <laughs> maybe something to something to consider. <laughs> One more. Something to consider. Yeah. That. All right, let's close. <laughs> <laughs> maybe something to pray about, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, well, yeah. Thank you, Candice, for. Oh wait, Davis Utah Public Schools. What? In 2020, 2012. Oh, Oh, they have God. a. It Davis. was removed in Hong Kong, twenty eighteen, and Singapore. Oh Davis, no, moved in Singapore. Davis County has had a lot of controversies though with yes. racism, yes, and other things. Really terrible like things. Yes. Yeah, that's where my friend Ray's from. Oh, ugh, it's really hard. That is really hard. Yeah. Um. But yeah, it says here twenty twenty three. Well, yeah, twenty twenty Kansas retained it, but twenty twenty three. Florida removed it. It's just that picking and choosing who who's already in your community, if they can stay in your community is what's happening to me in like the Davis County stories and these other places. Like it's not about being like, we don't want new people in here, which is also deplorable in my opinion. But it's that idea that like <laughs> the people that are in here, we're now going to decide who we want yep. to be in here mm-hmm. that have already been here for so long. And that's yeah. where these kind of like bills and challenges are coming are like extra, mm-hmm. extra crazy and hateful. Well, it's just so anti-community. Like it's you not caring about your community. You're caring about the power structure, mm-hmm. which is really sad. Super sad. Um, Thank you, Candice. Read the book. Yeah. Read the book. And even if you can't read the book, there's people reading it on YouTube. Yep. Uh, That's what I did. That's That's what I did. Because I couldn't find it at any libraries. Yeah. It was checked out at Provo. Springville. I don't have a... I couldn't find it. It I went yesterday. Yeah. I couldn't find it. Yeah. And it it was in in my library in Colorado that I have my Libby account attached Mm -hmm. to. Oh. So I had to watch it on YouTube and it was really sweet. It was. Yeah. I watched it with my kids. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It was a good time. It was cute. Very cute. Yeah. Well, right. thank you. Well, thank, thank you. Thank you, Candace, And you're welcome you're back right. literally anytime you want to be. Yeah. Seriously. <laughs> thank you for having We're me. We're very serious. That was so intelligent, so interesting. Mm-hmm. And I, like, now want to watch lots of documentaries. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, ready to really lose myself in this. <laughs> this is how I have a master's degree in biology. Uh, yes. We'll see you all next time, <laughs> folks. Bye. is produced by us, Nicola Corin and Eden Wen. Music written by me, Nicola Corin, and produced and performed by my dad, Frank.